Well, good evening, friends, and welcome to another episode of The Modifier. My name is Michael. I am a Dungeon Master right here for the Proficiency Bonus uh, Twitch channel. Thank you guys so much for tuning in with me tonight uh, as we go through and uh, do a little uh, creative stuff. Um, I also wanted to uh, throw out a couple announcements really quick uh, before we jump into the fun tonight. I um, wanted to mention and remind you all that Mystic Hour is coming up tonight uh, at 8.30 Eastern Time. That's 5.30 Pacific Time. So make sure you come back to the channel, hang out with Christy Mystic Water tonight as she hosts Mystic Hour. She's got some really special guests uh, planned for tonight. She's going to do kind of like a part two of this Women in D&D uh, series that she's been working on. Uh, she has three uh, lovely ladies from the Critical Role fan club that are going to be joining her. They're going to be talking a lot about Critical Role and the impact it's had on their lives. Um, they're also going to have a special guest, a craftswoman from Wormwood Gaming is going to be joining them live tonight. So that is going to be pretty amazing. I'm actually super stoked. Um, all my players from the Friday Night Storm King Thunder campaign that I Dungeon Master for here they pitched in and they got me a gift card to Wormwood Gaming. And I just recently purchased a uh, Zebra Wood dice, tabletop dice tray from Wormwood. I am so stoked. It's supposed to be, uh, it shipped out today, so I should have it in my hands on Monday. So maybe next week, whenever I go live, I can show it off for you guys so you guys can check out what it, what, it, what one looks like and... Um, but I, I highly suggest checking out Wormwood Gaming uh, to check out some of their awesome crafts that they've got that they use for tabletop roleplay. It's amazing. Um, also wanted to let you guys know that Storm King's Thunder Episode 44 is air airing tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern. So make sure that you come check us out. Um, and also, I wanted to give a big shout out to all of our followers. We recently reached 250 followers on Twitch. So thank you guys so much for clicking that follow button and uh, hanging out with us uh, each week. And thank you all so much tonight for joining me as we kind of dive back back into uh, doing some creative stuff with, with 5th Edition and things like that. So... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I hear you on that, Josh. Um, Wormwood, Wormwood Gaming, uh, they are pretty, they get kind of pricey. Um, that's, that's why I had to rely on gift cards for my friends and birthday <laughs> to end up purchasing what I really wanted. So, <laughs> but yeah, thank you guys so much for, uh, for following. So if you're tuning in right now, uh, go ahead and click that follow button. It's absolutely free to follow. Uh, does nothing but help uh, help encourage us to keep on producing this uh, this content, which we hope that you enjoy. So, I'm gonna dive in a little bit tonight. Last last week before Mystic Hour, we took a dive into <laughs> reskinning some undead from the Monster Manual. We took a skeleton and we kind of gave it this elemental magic about it. We made it a frost skeleton. And we kind of toyed around with that a little bit. We kept it like a low level, but I had some people in chat that were saying, man, this would be a really epic monster if we could boost up that challenge rating and make it more of like a boss or make it more of a tougher creature, which I totally agree with. So what I was thinking about doing is maybe sometime in the future jumping on here and Man, let's make some undead bosses, you know, some challenge ratings like up high, up past 10 or something like that. to where we can really juice these guys up. But it was an awesome episode of the Modifier last week. Thank you guys so much for pitching in and chat. Um, and please keep doing so uh, this week as well. Um, what this is going to be, this is going to be a multi-episode uh, uh, just, just stream. I, I can't cover all of this. There's no way I'm going to be able to cover all this, but I'm calling tonight Building a Dynamic Encounter. Um, the reason that I'm doing this tonight is because my game store group, which meets on Sundays, we're also going through Storm King's Thunder because I know it pretty well. I'm running it with my other group. Um, they have themselves in quite a predicament. Uh, at the beginning of Storm King's Thunder, there's a place where... As they're going through the town of the village of Nightstone, uh, there's an orc attack 
that's supposed to happen with an orc war chief leading kind of like a band of what's left of his army out of the R deep forest towards the town. Well, these players, they caught this group coming from a distance and they decided, Hey, let's, let's bolt. Let's get out of here. So they made their way out of, Oh yeah, definitely throw back to Nightstone, Christy. <laughs> but they bolted out of Nightstone, leaving the drawbridge down, leaving the town open for the taking. And they went to the dripping caves to take care of Hark and the trapped prisoners. Well, upon returning back from with all these 31 odd villagers, they found, they discovered that there were orcs in every one of the lookout towers and the drawbridge was up. <laughs> so this created an interesting scenario where they sat there and they planned for a good 45 minutes at least, maybe even an hour, on how they were going to get in. Well, long story short, our sorcerer decided to go up and suggest to the orcs that they drop the drawbridge and come on out to see some treasure or some, some items that they have that they would be interested in. The suggestion worked. They dropped the drawbridge. The orcs came out. Uh, they took care of the, them quickly, made their way inside, encountered a few more uh, bands of these orcs, took care of them quite easily. But this Sunday coming up, they will face off against the orc war chief, uh, Garash, who is now held up in the Nandar Keep. So what I thought tonight what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how we can use what's available to us to build a dynamic encounter and also how we can use the environment to help to raise the challenge a bit. What I'm finding out with my group at the game store is I've got eight players at the table and they're extremely powerful together. Um, they have done a really good job of playing to their strengths and helping each other out. Um, so what I'm going to do as a dungeon master tonight is I'm trying to find a way to make to up the ante a little bit, to make it a little bit more challenging without going too far overboard uh, to be on the verge of where it, it seems unfair. So I'm going to go ahead and show you guys uh, what I've got for my full screen right now. So you guys should be seeing, I'm hoping that you're seeing the map that I've got set up right now of... This is my Roll20 virtual tabletop, which I use at the game store. I hook it up to a television and lay the television flat on the table so that I use this as an actual digital map. Um, I do have small miniatures that I go ahead and put on the put on, physically on the TV so they can actually have that have that <laughs> part of the game where you can actually physically reach out, touch the miniature, move it across the board without having all these uh, digital tokens on there. I use the miniatures. But this is how I go through building my encounter. So what I've got is I'm going to have, one of the things I'm using is I'm using the environment to build this encounter. The first thing that's to advantage is my players, they are actually down here right now getting ready to climb up what is a bridge to the keep area now before they left nightstone the <laughs> furbog warlock <laughs> with the help of the tiefling fighter decided to rip off one of these doors and place it down over top of this gaping area across the bridge that was broken by a boulder so they had left that there so the bridge has a way for everybody to get across and that's why the orc war chief and the other orcs have made their way into the keep that thing wasn't there in the storm king Sunder text they don't care much about that keep but now since they have access to it i'm gonna make sure that they're using it because i think that would be to their advantage now keep in mind these orcs were on the run they're on the run from a band of elves from the R-Deep Forest. So they would want to use Nightstone as a defensive position. So I'm trying to make it where they're going to be using that to their advantage. Now I read online somewhere, or I, I posted in some forum, and it, which it's true, orcs are very aggressive. So they're going to be wanting to have control of the attack. They're going to be, they're going to be after the players. So I need to figure out exactly how I'm going to balance that between I'm going to hold this defensive position and I'm going to rush you. So that's where I'm trying to think of how I'm going to do that. A 
That's a good idea. At, at MX Lip, uh, a touch screen tabletop gaming table would be amazing. Um, currently, right now, I'm just using a 32 inch flat screen TV uh, to do what we're doing. I wish it was a little bit bigger, uh, but then again, I wouldn't want to be carrying it and lugging it back and forth to the game store every week. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, that's a great idea. Is especially with this campaign, Storm King's Thunder, the maps are humongous because you're talking about giants, and with giants comes giant maps, and that's the one big flaw about Storm King's Thunder that I see is if you're going to have miniatures and you're going to be using a table, these maps can be huge. I'm talking. I started to map out Nightstone on the back of. I don't know if you guys have, have realized this, but on the back of wrapping paper, there is a one inch grid system already aligned to where you can easily cut with scissors. So what I did was, is I blew up, I uh, basically took a Sharpie and just started drawing nightstone on the back of this wrapping paper. And when I started to get, I got about halfway and I'm like, wait a second. There's no way I'm going to be able to put this out <laughs> in the game store. We're going to take up half of the store, which is impossible because there's not enough room for that. It's always crowded there. Uh, so I had to go some other way. So we went digital. So have a good night, Christy. We're getting ready for your show as well. So uh, we will see you soon. And we will all be tuning in to uh, Mystic Hour tonight. So... Go get yourself ready. We will be seeing you soon. Awesome, awesome. So what we're going to do tonight, let's go ahead and see what we're going to do. First thing I want to do is I want to look at the enemies that my players are going to be encountering first. First and foremost, I've got the War Chief. Now, the War Chief, according to the Storm King Thunder text, when he first arrives, he's actually injured. Um, he suffered some arrows, uh, took some arrows from the elves that they were trying to raid. They were trying to attack these elves. Well, things didn't go so well for these orcs, and that's why they were retreating out of the forest. Gurash suffered some wounds, and he was down to 60 hit points. But here's the deal. They were supposed to enc encounter this at level 2. They are currently level 4. And now that the orcs have had time to kind of relax a little bit. I was just going to go ahead and bump his hit points back up to full because, you know, he's got, he's had time to kind of wrap up his wounds a little bit, kind of lick his wounds from that elf encounter. Yeah. And I think my players, if, if he's left with 60 hit points, that's not going to be very interesting for them. I, I want, I want there to be some sort of challenge here because I think there's a fine line between it's it can't be too easy especially when it comes to something like that kind of resonates as a boss fight they've been building up to this point as soon as they saw that the orcs were coming to nightstone i think it's been ingrained in their minds <laughs> that this is going to be something that is going to be a big epic thing and last week when we left off they had just beaten the um the eye of grumpsh that was, uh, that was also with this orc band and a lot of the orc soldiers. So we've been slowly building up the difficulty of encounter to this point. So I want to make sure that I deliver as a dungeon master because they've been waiting all week for this moment. I want to make it epic. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to boost his hit points all the way back up to 93 which may seem like a lot, but my players have been doing a really good job of taking care of business when it comes to hit point output. So Gurash, the war chief, he's now full health. So that basically added, a, you know, maybe another, you know, another at least round or two to his, his life, hopefully. And that's, that's true, uh, Josh Posas uh, says, do Capcom rules. Stronger, better performing players will face the same enemies, but these enemies will begin use swarming aggressive tactics. That's actually exactly where I'm thinking about going on this, uh, Josh. Because the one thing that I notice about the Orc Warchief that I love 
uh, if you look at the Orc War Chief character sheet, I'm going to try to make it as big as I can so you guys can see really well on here. But I love, um, well, for one, the Orc, the War Chief can do an extra 1d8 damage when it hits with a melee weapon attack. So that gives it that little extra boost. So each time he hits you, he's going to he's gonna hit you a little bit harder. Now, orcs hit hard as it is. The problem is they don't have very many hit points. So as, as I've discovered last week while we were playing in this, this game, um, the combat only lasted maybe three rounds. Just because my players, an orc only has 13 hit points. Or no, it's like 15 or 16 hit points, but it only has an AC of 13. So it has a low AC, low hit points. So they're easy to hit and they're easy to carve down. The thing is, though, is whenever they hit, they do a D12 with their great axe, which actually is pretty extensive. And I was rolling really good last week. I actually put, at the end of the session, the bard... Our fourth level bard still only has 14 hit points. Unfortunately, she rolled very poorly each time she leveled up. So I've also got to keep that in the back of my mind. As one of my players only has 14 HP. That means that if you do 28 points of damage to that character in one round, boom. They don't get to make death, death saves. They are done. <laughs> so I've got that in the back of my mind too. This war chief could possibly... I, I, this encounter could kill that player, so I'm I'm trying to keep that in mind as well. Another thing that I like about this is this battle cry feature. Now, they can only do it once per day, but each creature of the war chief's choice that is within 30 feet of it can hear it, and not already affected by battle cry. So that means if as long as they're not under effect from another battle cry of some sort gain advantage on attack rolls until the start of the war chief's next turn i love that basically what it's doing is it's buffing its enemies and the war chief can make one attack as a bonus action so that means during its first turn i'm probably going to use that feature as much as possible um because i'm going to take advantage of because honestly my combats have only been lasting three rounds so i gotta think i've got three rounds I'm going to start with the best stuff first and I'm going to pour it on heavy and then we're going to go from there to see how long it lasts. So I've already got my first, my first round of combat set for this war chief. Uh, he's going to do his battle cry. He's going to move and then he's going to use his bonus action to make an attack. Um, and I'm hoping that I'm going to position him in places that that battle cry is going to work. And it's going to work extensively because that's the only time he gets to do it. And then the rest of the time, he's just going to be sitting there whooping down, making these uh, great axe attacks that he can make two of them per round with the multi-attack feature. So I've got him boosted up. I've got an idea how I'm going to play him. The next thing I was thinking about doing is I've got four orcs that are with him. There were three orcs down here well actually there were four orcs that were left on the other towers because the players only took care of the two orcs that were in the front two towers by the drawbridge which was located over in this this location so they took care of the two orcs that were on top of those towers now the thing is, is they didn't take care of the other orcs so there were four left i had assumed that at least one or two of them would have noticed them coming in and taking care of some business, hearing the drawbridge come down. One of them did retreat to the keep and is now there uh, to guard the war chief. The other three, however, were a little bit farther away, and I am going to have them set up to come in behind the players, uh, giving it that other element uh, to to make uh, the thing about a dynamic encounter that I like the, the word dynamic it's always changing something else is involved something maybe something the players didn't expect or maybe they could have expected but they didn't really put two and two together or they didn't really plan everything out carefully before the encounter began so I've got these three orcs that were previously on the towers oh man something's going down we heard battle hey Let's go check it out. And by the time they get there, the players have already made their way into the keep. And this is another another level 
of that encounter that our players are going to have to face. Because you've got these three orcs that you're probably not accounting for that are coming from behind. So if you do the traditional marching order and all your healers and spellcasters are in the back, this is a prime opportunity, especially with the orcs. The orcs can use a bonus action for their aggressive feature. And I can show you on the Orc War Chief character sheet. It says aggressive right here. As a bonus action, the orc can move up to its speed toward a hostile creature that it can see. So as long as they can see them, they can use their bonus action to basically dash up to them. And then they still have their, their regular action, which would be, um, for, for a regular orc, it would just be a standard attack with their great axe. So they could do uh, a little... They could surprise our players a little bit with a feature, you know, just just these simple orcs that are coming from behind. Are they going to last very long? Probably not. They're probably only going to get one good shot. I like that, MX Lip. Yeah, I like creating liabilities in battle, throwing civilians and valuable NPCs in the midst of battle. That's cool. Misdirect range players and challenge melee players to play the mind game. I agree 100%. Um, now, our players do have a couple of allies with them that I might be able to play with. Um, or the orcs. Orcs do take hostages, but very rarely I would say that orcs do. Only if they're using them or taking them somewhere to be... <laughs> to, you know, gathering them to take them to their master, whoever hired them, or something like that. This is a situation where these orcs are pretty much defending this place and are going to defend it until the death. Um, they've been running from the other elves, but I love that uh, liabilities in battle, the civilians and valuable NPCs. Unfortunately, in this situation, all the valuable NPCs basically have, vac have vacated this place, so I don't really have any valuable NPCs. It, at this moment but MX lip definitely anytime you can throw a hostage situation in there oh yeah it's easier to do with changelings or mimics yeah <laughs> you know what's crazy is I never put a mimic in any of my games so far it's, it's nuts uh, I've been playing this game for a long time and never once have I used a mimic uh, so <laughs> I'm gonna have to uh I'm going to have to change that. Definitely going to have to change that. So we boosted Garash. We've got four orcs. We have these orcs who I think I'm going to have come in at the second round of combat. You know, the first round, we go through the whole round. We'll see how things are. And then I'll pop these guys in. So surprise, here comes the orcs. You didn't know we're coming. I'll bump them in on the second round. I was originally going to wait till the third round, but my players are good. And they're going through these combats so quickly that I'm afraid that if I don't bring them in the second round, it may not be even, there may not be even a point to bring them in the third round because they're just going to mow them down. Three regular orcs, it's going to be no problem for them. They took on seven last week um, pretty handedly. So, three is going to be cake. Speaking of cake, I've got Garash up here. And I was going to let you guys chime in on what you think of this. But what I was thinking about doing is I was going to give Jur uh, Garash, the war chief, two buffed personal guards. Now, here's the situation. Our players already know how many orcs there are because they saw the orcs coming and they have a ranger who was really who rolled a really good perception check. So I told them the number of orcs, which was two dozen that came there. So they've got this count in their head and they know how many orcs remain. So they're gonna be they're gonna hold me to it. Now I've got four orcs here on the top. What I was thinking about doing is I was thinking about changing two of these orcs out for two orogs. And I want to show you what an Orog looks like and what their character sheet is. And the reason I'm thinking about doing this is to beef up this encounter a little bit. These regular orcs, not going to be much of a challenge. With the Warchief, that's going to help them a little bit. 
but not too extensively, I don't think. I don't think they're going to make it more than two rounds if I leave it the way that it is. I'd like to see this one last at least three or four rounds. So what I'm thinking about, if I drag this O-Rog in here, I've got an O-Rog out here. Now these guys are pretty tough. I'm going to go ahead and click on them and you can see uh, basic info. That's that's kind of what they look like. Basically, they're they're a buffed up. They're savage. They, like they're, they're just a buffed up version of an orc. O-Rog, here we go. O-Rogs are orcs blessed with a surprisingly keen intellect. So they're smarter than the average orc. Um, they believe that it's a gift from the goddess Luthic. Um... Orogs prefer to live underground. They, orcs respect an Orog's strength and cunning. Lone Orog might command an Orc warband. So or Orogs themselves could basically be the leader of this warband. But I've got a war chief already. And... This, yeah detached nothing wanting nothing more than to hack their enemies into pieces you know that's they are deadly rivals to war chiefs who must be weary of orog treachery so you know they might not trust each other but to have them here it would be within the realm of possibility. And the other thing that I like about these, they got, they're wearing plate mail. So their armor class is boosted. Like even the war chief itself, he only has an armor class of 16. The Orog is boosted up here to 18. So you gotta, you have to really hit these guys. Uh, you gotta roll well to make sure that you make contact with these guys to get through their armor. They also have boosted HP. They have 42 hit points each. So what I was thinking about doing was I was thinking about taking two of these bad boys and putting them up here and taking two of these regular orcs and just, kick, just kicking them to the curb. So now what we did was is we're going to put one down here. Maybe he's commanded by Gurash to uh, stand by his side. We'll put one right here, kind of waiting by the steps. So you got these two Orogs here. Um, or even... Yeah, you know what? I'm going to keep that... Uh, I'm going to see how how big this area is. So there is just out of range. So as a as a good Dungeon Master should... I'm going to make sure that Gurash is in range to use his battle cry for everybody that's up here. Um, you know, Gurash wouldn't hide. He wouldn't hide at all. He'd be ready. So we got Mr. Orog and Gurash right there. You know, he's, he's not going to hide from these guys. You know, what's he got to fear? He's an orc war chief. Come on. Who's going to mess with him? Bring it on. You know? <laughs> Another thing that I've got to keep in mind is at the end of last week's encounter, our cleric, who is the race Asimir, was flying and was actually flying above this entryway. If he was flying high enough, everybody up here would have seen him and he would have also seen all of them. So I've also got to keep in mind as a dungeon master that they are going to know exactly what's coming for them. These orcs may even, might even try to throw javelins at him um, at the start, at the very start of our next session. So if he didn't realize they were up there, he will very quickly. And they're probably in desperate need of a short rest as well. So I got to keep that in mind as well. My players have not rested. The bard is unconscious, taking a beating. Some of the other ones have lost hit points from the the great axe attacks from these orcs down here at the at the base of this ramp. So that in itself adds a little bit of intensity to the encounter. I haven't given they haven't had a rest. They've been in three little fights so far. I mean granted two weren't very challenging at all. They've been in two little fights and one bigger fight. Hadn't taken a short rest. 
So if the Asimir decides, hey, let's charge up here now when he sees them, that's going to add another level of intensity to this, this encounter because they're not going to have time to spend, take a short rest, spend hit dice or whatever. But if he decides to retreat down here, there is an opportunity that they may be able to flee to one of these other areas, get themselves ready for the battle. That might change even the way these orcs approach. These orcs might already be there if they go back and they take a short rest. And that could add a little bit of interest, uh, interesting element to the encounter. So <laughs> as a dungeon master, I'm kind of like, ah, man, this could go either way. And that's exciting. That's the one thing I love about it. Um, so we can see we can see how this happens. Perhaps these orcs go up there and they can kind of get ready. Maybe they barricade the door up here or something like that to get things ready for, for something happening. So we boosted it up we put some orogs in here took out two of the other orcs so we've got the numbers right we boosted his hit points we're good on that now what i think we're going to do is we're going to play around with the environmental aspect of things one thing that i keep on reading about in different forums uh, different blog posts different uh, tweets from other dungeon masters uh, people, you know, who do this a lot more than I do. Uh, and I want to put in a disclaimer out there that I am no expert at any of this. Uh, this is stuff that I just like to play around with. And sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, I've built encounters before where I thought, oh, this is going to be pretty tough. And my players just wipe right through it. You know, piece of cake. Um, I've made encounters where I'm like, oh, this is going to be, this is going to be a cakewalk. It ends up being difficult, I, you know? Uh, so I'm not, I'm no expert. These are just things that I'm trying, and maybe we can try them together and see what happens. You know, you never know. Um, so what I want to do is I want to play around with the environment a little bit. Uh, and what I'm going to do to play around with this environment uh, is I think I am going to have the front door of the keep be barricaded in some way. Uh, the orcs have had time to establish this, this keep. They've probably had... Actually, probably had they had an entire day actually until the players came back because they left at the very uh, early morning, came back probably just after lunch from the Dripping Caves encounters, saw that the orcs were there and decided to go ahead and take a long rest before trying to get into Nightstone to take advantage of the cover of darkness, which which is a good idea. Orcs do have dark vision, so but you know it was better for them to go at night because they also have a drow <laughs> in their party who has sunlight sensitivity so anything done in the broad daylight is very uh <laughs> it's challenging for our drow bard so i think i'm going to have the doors barricaded the problem with that is uh, there is still this entryway into the bottom of the keep from where it was demolished from the cloud giant attack so our players are still going to be able to get in either way. Um, they'll just have to, to, you know, navigate this difficult terrain of basically it's just a pile of rubble on the side from where the boulder came in and smashed this place to bits. Um, I'm having I'm going to have the orcs stationed on the roof. I think that makes sense because Garash would have visual. And he's going to want to see if these if these elves are coming after him. So I'm going to have him positioned on the roof. Now I think that'd be a really cool place to have an encounter. Um, I know you see in movies all the time these uh, intense battles and fight scenes that are done on the ro uh, roof of a really tall building. And that adds that other element in there that, that man, if I get too close to the edge of this thing... I could fall. <laughs> so that gives you another aspect of this encounter. Um, think about you're on the roof. If one of your players gets close to that roof, you can have an orc charge them and shove them off of the roof, causing them to fall 30 feet, take those 3d6 bludgeoning damage as they hit the ground. Um, this... This keep is only a two-story keep, 
So you add the roof and you're talking about, uh, you know, a three story fall. Hey, that could be, that could be significant. You know, it's going to take that. It may not kill that player, but it's going to take that player out of the combat encounter for a little while. I may want to do that to the tiefling fighter or the dragonborn rogue, you know, thinking about the, the, the players that are doing the most when it comes to damage output. That might be a thought process going into it. You know, how can I make that a little bit more interesting? Drop those players off the side of that keep. <laughs> so now you added another element to your encounter. Uh, and, and that's what building a dynamic encounter is, is all about. You know, what are all the ways that I can I can do this? How, how, can I, how can I adapt this encounter? How can I keep it moving in different ways? Giving it things that the players didn't expect. Or maybe they expected, just didn't know what happened. Um... Nothing is out of the realm of possibility in Dungeons and Dragons, and it, that's what makes it so cool. And it, it helps to make that storytelling so much more epic. Whenever you have these moments that are happen, uh, how how tense would it be seeing that orc running up to push you, and, and then uh, making that save to hold on to the edge of the keep and to pull yourself up to continue fighting valiantly with your friends? Oh man, just oh, I'm excited just thinking about the uh, the opportunities here. Okay. So, let's think about the other environment uh, aspects. So we've got the door barricaded downstairs. They're either gonna have they're they're gonna have to find another way in. They're not gonna be able to get through that door. Uh, they will probably enter maybe through the stones up here to the front. They may enter to the stones in the back. Either way, they're gonna have to make their way inside one of those one of those elements. The next thing they gotta do is they gotta make their way up the steps. There are two levels of steps that they've gotta climb up. How could we make that more interesting? Okay, well, the orcs have had access all day to the trading post in the center of town. Who's to say they didn't stock up and bring a bunch of crates, bring a, cup, bring a bunch of barrels, bring items from the trading post, which it says in the Storm King's Thunder text that basically anything under 10 gold pieces is available in the trading post for the... It, Basically, it's for the PCs. If they want to come in, they want to grab anything. Um, since the town is abandoned, they could go in there and they could get like 1D4 items that are 10 gold pieces or less from the trading post. Because there's nobody working there. <laughs> it's, it's basically the goblins have already raided it, but there's still some left. The orcs come in. Hey, we could take all this stuff. Let's take it up to the keep. We can use it. Um, things like you know, maybe javelins. Maybe they have a barrel full of javelins so they don't run out and they could just keep whipping these things off the top of the keep at the players while they're trying to get in. Um, that's, a, that's a possibility. Leave it up totally up to your ranged fighters to take care of the two front, front end orcs. Um, then what I also was thinking of, what if this, what if this Orog or if they take a short rest and these other three orcs are up here on top of the roof too, what if they had, <laughs> what if they had torches? They got them from the trading post. They've got some torches. They could take flasks of lantern oil. Perhaps they got flasks of lantern oil from the trading post. And as the players are trying to come up these steps, have the orcs tossing these however many flasks of oil they've got and trying to hit the players with the flasks of oil as they're coming up the steps and <laughs> then using the torches to try to ignite them or lighting the stairs the area of the stairs on fire making it harder the, the players would have to either find find some way to get through that fire or figure out another way um changing the encounter in that way tossing oil flask igniting it making flames and smoke fill the the inside of this staircase make it an even harder for them to get to where they want to go um and then i thought of another you know what if perhaps maybe even maybe even backtrack a little bit what if before what if before they started throwing these flasks down the down the steps what if they had big heavy barrels 
just these big heavy wooden barrels that they shove down the steps at the players, requiring them to make a dexterity saving throw to jump out of the way or just get mauled and knocked prone by these things. Maybe they take a little bit of damage, improvised weapon damage or, you know, a couple D6s worth of damage or something like that on these heavy barrels that are just rolling, uh, been kicked down the steps by the Orog or a couple orcs. Um, that would add another element, you know, and they would have time to prepare something like that. Hey, you know, they're up here on a roof. They're getting their stuff together. Hey, we could, we could take this. We could use this. For this scenario, would you be considering cover applications? It might be a bit difficult. Um, Josh, what do you mean by cover applications? Like something that... Um, bonuses to AC based on whether they have a little bit of cover or not? True? Um... And you're right, Josh. It may be difficult. If I add too much to it, I'm afraid that I'm going to leap over that fine line. So, it may be too difficult. Especially with throwing these O-Rugs in there. I may need to take them back out. I need to maybe take them out and just put the, put the regular orcs back in. Because... If I'm going to be adding all this other element on preventing the players from getting up here in the first place, this roof encounter may be a little bit too hard. Yeah, Josh, I do, I, I definitely do consider half cover, right? Three quarters cover, giving you the, uh, well, we got half cover, which gives you the plus two bonus to your AC. You've got three quarters cover that gives you a plus five bonus to your AC. And then you have full cover, total cover, which basically means, you know, unless you have a spell that hits anything with full cover, um, they'd be pretty, pretty much out of question. Orcs are not very good when it comes to ranged fighting. So they're, I think basically their whole, their advantage is going to be when, once the players get to the top of this thing. That's where the strength of the orcs is going to come in. These these couple orcs may throw a few javelins at the characters coming in. They're not very good at it. They may hit one or two of them before they actually get into the structure. And the next time they'll encounter them is, is basically on the steps. So, I don't know. What do you guys think in chat? Uh, do you guys think maybe the orogs are a little bit too much? Do you think maybe I need to drop some of the uh, stair attacks uh, based on coming up the steps to the players? Um, what do you guys think? Because I definitely don't want it to be too difficult. And I'm seeing, you know, Josh, Josh and chat. It, you're, you're right. It may be too hard. Because if you think about it, an orc war chief right here, his challenge rating is already a four. And the way that works, challenge ratings work in Dungeons and Dragons is challenge rating four means for, you know, four to five level four players, him by himself is an adequate challenge. But then you add in these other elements, the terrain, the environment. Keep in mind, though, I do have eight level four players. That modifies things a bit because I think the key to it is the action economy. Um... So far, it's mostly been in the hands of my players. And that balance is a fine line when it comes to challenge rating. Because anytime the players get more actions than their opponents and their enemies, it weighs highly in favor of your players. Which is not a bad, it's not a bad thing. But in order to make a challenging encounter and, and raise the ante, so to speak, a little bit, I think the key to it is that action economy. And in this situation, I think what I'm doing is by adding some creatures that have multi-attack, it's giving a little bit more balance to that action economy. I also have a sorcerer who has quicken spell, so he can basically, you know, fire off some normal spells 
with his bonus action. So that that is another thing when it comes to action economy that kind of favors them a little bit. They're not quite they're not level five yet, so they're not doing double attacks or anything. Uh, the fighter hasn't gotten extra attack yet. Neither is the rogue. So if you think about it, you got your players. You got eight eight turns in that round. Right now, if they come up here as it is, I've got one, two, three, four, five. I've got five, but these three have multi attack. So I basically count that as two, two actions. Whenever we're uh, talking action economy, as far as the NPCs or enemies go, so that's kind of how I'm balancing it. Um, but yeah, uh, if... what I could also do is I can. Yeah, they're not exactly tier two characters yet. They're almost there. Yeah, it is. It's a very fine line. What I may do, Josh, thinking about that over is, I may, because none of these, none of these tokens are going to be on this map when my players see it. What I may do as a dungeon master, and dungeon masters, you know, your table, your rules, which is the one thing that I love about Dungeons and Dragons. I may keep these OROG tokens just to the side. And if I see that the players are really struggling, I may not make them OROGs. I may just have them as be regular orcs. And then once they get up to the top, make that, like even make, as these orcs are just popping out and just throwing barrels and oil and fire down at them, I may not make it to where they can see them too well or they just look like orcs and then kind of gauge the encounter based on that. If it's if it's a cakewalk for them to get up to the top, then I will slam those two Orog tokens out there. If if I see that it's beating them up a little bit, I may just throw two regular orcs up there and then just call it that, and then have Gurash just try to go nutso on basically the first person that comes up there, which will probably be the Tiefling fighter, and our sorcerer will probably use a large on him uh, once he gets up to the top. So I've got an idea of what spells that they have and what they're probably going to do based on their other encounters. So that's another thing you got to keep in mind too. Your players, <laughs> especially if you've got smart ones like I do. I've got smart ones in both... Uh, games that I DM for right now I've got incredibly smart ones on Friday night uh, on my online game um, and I've got incredibly smart players at the game store as well and that's right Josh um, Josh says that would be fine too as DM you technically control the world uh, cosmically at any point in time, enemies change, exist, not exist at your judgment on the fly. And honestly, and that's that. Sometimes that's what makes Dungeons and Dragons work. Um, <laughs> and sometimes it ends up being a die roll as well. Um, what can happen? What what can't happen? And I know right now I'm building a difficult encounter, but I I think I, I think I do want to challenge them at least at least with this so far, because after this, they're going to be challenged again. Uh, a little bit going forward maybe the next couple of encounters won't be quite as challenging as this one but then again once they start meeting the giant confrontation head-on things are going to start to get a little bit harder for them but at level five once you hit that tier two like what you were talking about josh uh you find you you find out that your characters do get pretty powerful at level five going up um, as I found out in my Friday night campaign that air is here tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Um, these characters are extremely powerful now. I mean, I had I had my Friday night group take out basically uh, they're smart about it, but they took out basically 12, 12 frost giants, <laughs> a dozen of them. Um, and they're able to do so because of, of how powerful they've gotten once they hit that tier two point uh, part of their character creation the character development so we've got this going on so far you know what i'm gonna go ahead and put some in here just to remind i wonder if i can find some crates or something that i can put out here that are like free yeah like something like that like a wooden crate 
Oh, there's like crates and barrels. I like that one. So we can drag that up there. Maybe some crates and barrels right here. We can copy and paste that one. Maybe some crates and barrels right there. That'll give that aspect. I like that crate too. We'll put that crate over there. We'll put it right, right beside him. Yeah, so they've got some equipment, some materials here that they've gathered up from the trading post. Um, yeah, so we've got so many different elements here to this encounter. We've got, first of all, the approach. Uh, they've got a climb up here, which isn't going to be a problem until the orcs see them. You've got the barricaded door. You've got to come in through the through the difficult terrain, either in the front here or... or or curve around the backside of the, the keep to get in here. You've got to make your way up the stairs with these orcs uh, rolling barrels and throwing flasks of oil and torches down at you. And then once you get up to the top, you've got to deal with all this at the top. On top of that, trying not to get shoved off of the roof. So there are a ton of different ways that this encounter can go. Um, and you can build it really any way that you want it and like like i said uh with with our conversation josh going through this you know as a dungeon master if you feel like your players can't handle it or they're about halfway through or they can't get up these steps i'm just going to change those two orogs back to orcs and just see how they do and what i may do is if they decide to take a short rest i may take one of those orogs out of there especially if these three orcs have made their way back up to the top of the keep. Because I think that having two orogs up there with those three other orcs might be a little bit overwhelming once the players actually get to the roof. So, I think that would be good. So, just to kind of uh, recap what we talked about tonight uh, in building a dynamic encounter... Uh, the two things that I focused on were using what you already have. Basically, using the characters or the character races that we already have and just finding other ways that we can juice them up. Um, whether you want to boost hit points of a certain character or boost an armor class or just find a different way of, of working with the enemies that you have Starting with that first and seeing how you can develop a more dynamic or interesting encounter based on that, what you have. The second thing is, and the big thing that I, that I read a lot in different forums and just seeing a lot of different things, is using the environmental aspects of the encounter to make things a little bit more interesting. Um, and here what we did is we have the orcs on the roof of the keep, well defense position, They've got all these uh, items and equipment that they're using from the trading post that they raided. They've got the door barricaded. They're ready. And to me, that just makes sense. That makes sense. They would be ready for this. Um, Josh says it may also be wise to discuss the respect, uh, respect option if you feel that the player's characters have incredibly low odds of surviving the campaign. Or if the players feel they need a change, it's been acceptable to be able to respect before Tier 2 in Adventurers League, but that's up to your group. If it's not appropriate to have that respect, then that's fine too. Yeah, um, <laughs> the funny thing is about Storm King's Thunder, at the very beginning of the book, it has a disclaimer at the very beginning to have this conversation with your players before you start. Most of the encounters in Storm King's Thunder are challenged at deadly encounters. Most of them are deadly by design. Uh, they do that on purpose because they want there to be that kind of intensity and that realism when it comes to you're going against giants. There is, <laughs> there is a chance that your character might die. And they really flush that out at the beginning of Storm King's Thunder. And I, I was lucky enough that I've got two groups of players that I've had this conversation with. And they both said, you know what, we understand it's just a game. We know that there's a chance that my player, my character could die. 
I'd be I'd be fine with rolling up a new one if that happens. So uh, that's that's a good point, Josh. You always want to bring that up with your with your players, usually ahead of time, usually before you start a campaign, just to get that out of the way and out in the air. Uh, especially, you know, they're this uh, this game is pretty challenging at times. And hey, no harm and no foul in running away and coming back another day as well. So if they find out they're too too much for them, they can retreat. There's always that option too. So we'll see. I, uh, I'll let you guys know next week uh, how exactly Sunday goes and how my players end up uh, managing this uh, <laughs> this encounter with these orcs on the roof of the Nandar Keep and Nightstone. So I'll keep you guys posted and let you know. Um, other than that, I'm just going to remind you guys tonight that we have Mystic Hour coming up in about 30 minutes. So make sure you guys uh, stick around. Uh, Christy Mystic Water is going to be hosting uh, that awesome show. It's a talk show. Tonight she's going to have more women of D&D. Tonight's focus is going to be more on uh, Critical Role and its impact and its impact on D&D and, and women in D&D. Uh, we also have a craftswoman from Wormwood Gaming that's going to be live with Christy tonight. So if you have some questions you want to ask uh, for someone who works at Wormwood or any questions uh, pertaining to Critical Role or anything like that, make sure you guys jump into chat and uh, make sure you, you type those in and get those to Christy so she might be able to uh, put those questions on air tonight. Um, don't forget, Storm King Slender episode 44 will be tomorrow night at 8 p.m., so we're hoping that uh, you can enjoy, join us for that. If you haven't followed our channel, make sure you follow our channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube uh, to catch up on all of our previous episodes. And thank you guys so much. Uh, reaching 250 followers on, tw on Twitch, that was a big deal for us. So thank you guys so much. We do appreciate the support. And it's, uh, it's, it's humbling beyond belief, uh, to say the least. So before I go tonight... Uh, next week, I'm not sure what uh, what the stream is going to be about. It may be another uh, <laughs> another episode of this dynamic encounter based on where I may, am with my campaigns. It may be another reskinning of the undead because we only got to reskin one of those <laughs> undead creatures last time, and I've got a couple other undead uh, creatures in mind that I would like to stream on the modifier, and we can adjust them and we can do some cool things with them. So make sure you guys come and check that out and help me out in uh, updating and building these uh, these new enemies for possibly some of my groups to run into in the future. Uh, other than that, man, thank you guys so much for checking, out, uh, checking in tonight and hanging out with me. Don't forget, 30 minutes, Mystic Hour will be, uh, be right up. So until next time, guys, I want to just say uh, uh, thank you all so much. And don't forget to add your proficiency bonus have a good night, everybody. Don't forget about Mystic Hour coming up in 30 minutes. See you guys next time.